I want us to look the mission in the eyeballs today. Are we fulfilling the mission? Now, it, um, it is easy sometimes to excuse ourselves from the work that God has called us to do by, by convincing ourselves that we are so busy with church-related things. And we really are. We're doing good. We're doing good things. It's not that we're out here robbing banks or, or uh, you know, we're not, we're not shooting people or doing anything illegal or, or anything. We're doing good things. Yeah. But we, we can get wrapped up in ourselves yeah. to the point that we are obli- uh, oblivious to, to the souls that God has given, given around us. I want to read another scripture that has been a blessing to me, and it's in Psalms chapter 2, verse 8, he says, Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Isn't that what Jesus said, go ye to all the world? If people don't have the Holy Ghost, they're heathens. You and I were heathens before we got to Holy Ghost. Yeah. He said, I'll give thee the heathen man for inheritance. You say, you say uh, uh, we want the church to grow. Then you got to get some heathens because that's, what, that's your inheritance. And uh, the only way to get them is to go out there where they are. Sometimes it, it uh, is amazing, but as the church, we have gone to sleep and hung out the do not disturb sign and it takes meetings like this to jar us and bring us to the cold reality and you know I want you to understand there's a lot of churches you know I've never been to a church that didn't think they were friendly every church I've ever been to the pastor said you know we're a friendly we're a friendly bunch of people and some of them are but they're friendly among themselves Um, I'm trying to get the Sebastopol Church with the Copeland Church, we're trying to get them to uh, follow the three-minute rule. And the three-minute rule says that for the first three minutes when church is dismissed, I will not talk to my friends, my buddy, pals. I will go to outsiders, to guests that are there, and I will talk to them for the first three minutes. The first three minutes is devoted to, to church guests because uh, I have actually seen people come among us and leave and never be they were greeted when they came in but I, I can tell you that I have gotten several Bible studies by following people to their vehicles when church was over now I'm not talking about you don't have to body slam them lasso them or hog tie them I'm not talking about that okay but I am saying that that we lose a lot of business, but you know, we, I, I told uh, Pastor uh, Varnum this morning uh, there was a, an older preacher that that I always thought was so great in outreach, and he'd say he had a real slow Texas drawl, and he'd say, "We're in the papal business," and we are. We're in the people business, and we got to understand that it is a business. And God has entrusted us to carry on this business. And so there are visionary. If you are here today, you are a visionary. You have something that you see more than just the average person sees. And I'm not saying, I know there are visionaries in this church that are not here this morning for whatever reason. I'm not offended by that. Sometimes, you know, we, we, we're busy people. And, and we get things going and we got a lot going. And if you're living, you're busy. But somewhere, somebody's got to challenge us and to help us to, help us to keep the main thing the main thing. Now, I want to talk to you about steps of personal evangelism. Inviting people to church is a great thing. I, I, I believe there would be a tremendous, if we, if we did it, organized, and did it, 
correctly, inviting people to church could, could uh, produce great results. Just going out, knocking doors, just inviting people to church. But it is not witnessing. Witnessing is giving the first-hand account of your conversion. And everybody's got a story. I applied for a job one time. <laughs> I was, I really, I mean, it's, I guess it was probably more the flesh than the spirit. That, but they, they had this uh, position came open, uh, United Pentecostal Church in, in, uh, in uh, uh, <clears throat> New Orleans. And they, they were going to give, they were going to hire somebody, give them vehicle, dwelling, $60,000 a year, expense account. I said, I'm your man. And they said, well, we can't hire you because you don't have a story. I said, what do you mean? Well, you never killed anybody. You've never been to prison. We, we want somebody that's been on drugs, alcohol. I said, well, and, and at first it kind of hurt my feelings. Then I got to thinking, well, I got, a, I got a good story. I got a story better than that. I got a story that, you know, uh, I, I, was, I was raised in the church. And uh, my dad, my dad was a mental patient, and uh, he was in the mental hospital, and and uh, we were poor. When I was twelve years old, I got the Holy Ghost. I never, I've never been on drugs. I've never smoked. I've never been to jail. I don't know, I don't know uh, what sin is. I don't know, you know. And so I think that's a pretty good story that the Lord has protected me, and I've lived this life. And. So we all have a story, and you need to practice on, on telling your story. I was at a church one night, <laughs> and they all got to bragging about how bad they used to be. I'm telling you. And so this was testimony service turned into this contest. If, see, see, he could tell the baddest story, and this one guy got up, and he said, you don't know, I was bu -bu -bu bad <laughs> And so, so you, we don't need to emphasize on how bu -bu bad we was, but we need to have a concise, it ought to, you ought to be able to tell your story in less than three minutes. Let me tell you what. Jesus Christ knew that that was the most effective tool that could be used. That's why he said, you shall be witnesses. I will, you shall receive power at the, you shall be witnesses. And that's what we are. And when we begin to witness to the world around us, then we begin to do the work of evangelizing our world, our friends. The church is the house that Fran built. Our friends, relatives, acquaintances, and neighbors. You win people to God, that's who you're going to win. Your friends, relatives, acquaintances, and neighbors. And so we need, a, we, need to, we need to think about a way. There are books that are even written on this. There's a, a pamphlet, a booklet that you can get that will guide you through Telling your own story, how to, how to get it into a concise, organized um, way of telling, telling the story. And so that's what a witness is. And when you do this, if, you, if, you, if you're talking to somebody and say, well, you know what? I used to smoke three packs of cigarettes a day. And I tried everything to quit. I couldn't quit. I tried everything. I, I took the shots, the patches, and, and the uh, program. I went to the meetings. And I, I did everything, and I still smoked. But I went to church one day. I went to the altar and repented of my sins. I got baptized. And you know what? I never wanted another cigarette. Now, listen. That's hard to argue with. And when you, it, it brings the, the hearer to a moment of truth. He's either got to say, well, this man's telling me the truth, or he's a, he's a liar. And so it brings, it brings it down. The chips are down. When you give a personal witness like that, the chips are down. You, there's nowhere to go from there. The person's at a crossroad. They must decide either I'm going to believe what this person says or I'm going to reject it. That's what makes it so powerful. That's why every business in the world wants testimonials. I bought my car over here at Sons of Boy, they're so good to you, blah, blah, blah. I buy furniture down here because they stand behind what they sell and la, la. That's what everybody wants. And guess what? That's what God wants. He wants us to be witnesses, to give our testimony of what He has done in our lives. That's why you always got to 
be happy when you go out and talk to people because you, you know, even if it, even if it's a fake smile, you need to smile. And so you need to, you need to have the joy of the Lord, or at least to have the simulance that you have the joy of the Lord. <laughs> All right. Another step of evangelism is visitation. Building a bridge of friendship between you and your prospect. And that's what you're doing. You're building a bridge of confidence and trust between you and your prospect. I want to say this from the onset here. People are always on different levels. People are crisis-oriented. People usually don't, I, 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 would, I, I would venture to say that, that half of every congregation, those people that came to God, they were in some kind of crisis when they came. That's why they, came, that's why they turned to God. And guess what? If you've been visiting that person and you've been slowly talking to them about the Lord, they're going to think of you. If not, they're going to think about the Baptist preacher that's been dropping by to see them. Or the Jehovah Witness that keeps knocking on their door and won't quit. So, that's why, that's why I'm, I'm telling you, you've got to develop a consciousness. Soul winner's consciousness about what you're doing. Now, if, if I, every, every, every soul winner I've ever met has some type of a prospect file. It could be it, it could be very uh, elaborate or it could be very informal. My my wife just jots things down. I don't know how she keeps up with them, but she does. But she's better than I am. And I I, I got I, I was going to show you today. Um, I got just I mean this is old school, and probably you might even say, well, man, that's that's old fashioned. But I had I had these you know like spreadsheets made when I was. When I was doing outreach in South Haven, Mississippi, and I did this in Macon, Georgia, and I did this in Pensacola, Florida, everywhere I've been, it's just just something like this. Just a name, their name, their address, phone numbers, and some kind of notation about them. And then um, I did the same with absentees. If people start missing church, I want to find out why they're missing church. You say, well, that, that's none of your business. Well, if you're a soul winner, let me tell you what happened. Uh, there was a lady in our church in South Haven, Mississippi, Brother Sandy's church, and she would be at church every Sunday morning, but she wouldn't come on Sunday night. Now, I got to thinking about that. That seemed like a fine lady. I mean, she looked like the picture of holiness, everything. Why is this lady never at church on Sunday night? So I got to working and going, and my wife and I would go visit her home. And so she began to tell me the story about her husband and how that he was a brick mason, and, and, uh, and, and she just began to tell me about, about how he was so involved in this. I'm trying to make a long story short. After I, after I began to visit with them and talk with them, we got him in the church. He got the Holy Ghost, and now, and now they're both in church every Sunday morning and every Sunday night. Because I didn't just say, well, you know, I don't know why sister don't come to church. Bless God, she ought to know better than that. She, there, there may be reasons why people do the things they do. And so if you work with them and they begin to trust you and you build that confidence in them. And so I study church rec- records. That's my number one um, fishing pond of finding prospects. If somebody, I like this, I like this. If somebody comes to see us, I go to see them. I find out where they live. I find out what their job is, what their interest in, in uh, if they like fishing, hunting. I want to know all about that. Why? Because I'm trying to win that soul to the Lord. I'm trying to reach out to that person. I'm trying to build this, friend, this bridge of friendship with them. Um, just recently in South uh, Sebastopol, Mississippi, uh, 
there's a mechanic started coming to church. And his shop is way out from where we live. It's not, there's shops closer. But guess what? I go to his shop. And he's charging me probably twice for a battery. I could probably get a battery for my old car down at Walmart. Probably get one for a lot cheaper. And, you know, but he's charging. But guess what? I said, you know, you know, Jamie, I want you to put the best battery you got in that car. And I, I you know, because I trust you and, you know, and, 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 and what, guess what? I got a Bible study with him. You say, well, yeah, but I, I you know, I, I, I think I'm telling you right now, if you're going to win souls, it's going to cost you money. And more than that, it's going to cost you time. Because that's what it takes to win people to the Lord is your time. And we don't like to. You can get people to pay money, give an offerings, and give a pint of blood before you can get them to give their time. But that's what it takes to win souls. The soul winner spells love, T-I-M-E, because that's what it will require if you're going to win people to the Lord. So you got to be willing. You got to be willing to to invest your time and your efforts in people because we're in the people business. Now, some Bible studies. It's sometimes it's easy to get a Bible study. Well, guess what? Everything we do has got to be saturated with prayer. I might forget the power of prayer. You might forget the power of prayer. But Satan will never forget the power of prayer. That's why he does everything he can to keep us from praying. Because he knows. He knows what will happen. He knows what happened in the second chapter of Acts. He knows what happens what happened when the church prayed and Peter was in jail, and the, but prayer was made without ceasing. He knows that when, when, the, when they came together in the fourth chapter of Acts, the place was shaken. Satan remembers all that. We forget about it. We get involved in other things, but the devil knows if we start praying, that things start happening. Yeah. So I was sitting in a restaurant, and I was showing this chart to a uh, missionary. And honestly, do not think the missionary was interested in all, at all. But I was flipping through the chart and showing it to him. Just, just like this. Just, and this is, he's kind of looking around, thinking his french fries are getting cold or whatever. A man and woman came across the restaurant and said, what is that? I said, well, it's a Bible study we've had, uh, we just had uh, published. Big, tall guy. I'll never forget. Daniel was 6'6". Six, six. He was... Uh, from Haiti, and his, his wife Daniel and Tamika, and they stood there and they talked a little bit. I could see a little bit of watery eyes, and he said, could you come to my house maybe Monday or Tuesday night, and five weeks later we baptized them in Jesus' name. I got the Holy Ghost. You say, well, man, is it always that easy? No, but guess what? Getting that Bible study was, was just a, was a, just a uh, fulfillment of prayer, consecration. You see what I'm saying? You say, well, man, that was so easy. I'm going to jump up and go do that. Well, you better jump up and pray a little bit before you go do that. Because that's, that's, what, that's what the backlog of prayer and dedication is what made that happen. I think I told last night about the man in Gulfport. Um, young man in the church there wanted me to go with him on a Saturday. We went out. We talked this man lesson one. I left town. Um, Bruce followed up on it, taught him all the lessons. They baptized him in Jesus' name a couple of Sundays ago. He got the Holy Ghost. Um, I, want, I want to tell you. I want to tell you about the first the first man I ever won to the Lord with a Bible study. Um, it's something about this uh, story that just I love to tell it, and it, it, what's the word I'm looking for? It stoked me up. It pumped me up so much 
that it's, it's kept me going all these years. And this, this was like almost 25 years ago now this happened. I was in um, uh, Collinsville, Oklahoma, preaching a revival. And <laughs> I got to thinking, you know, I don't, I preach at night. That's back when they really had revivals, brother. I mean, my God, brother, it was every night, no rest nights. I mean, this is B.C. And, uh, and, <laughs> and so I said, well, you know, I'm not doing anything in the daytime. I, mean, I was praying and all this, but I wonder if there's something else I could do. So, so um, I had studied the two-day Bible study. So all, all I knew at the time. And I studied it and studied it till I, I thought I was pretty good at it. So I said, I said, has anybody here got somebody you'd like for me to go see? This little lady, Tammy Kay, she raised her hand. She said, I'd like for you to go see my husband. I want to tell you right now, Brother Busby, he's the meanest man in town. I said, okay. I said, everybody pray for me. I'm going to see the meanest man in town. And uh, so, I, I, you know, I'll never forget. I was scared. I really was. I, I prayed, and, and uh, my wife was praying, and I went out. And, and when I never, he had a big wrought iron fence around his yard and they had dogs, big dogs. And, and, uh, <clears throat> so I went on and, and I knocked on the door and he came to the door and, uh, I, I, I looked up at him and I said, uh, I'm Sterling Busby and, and I want to teach you a Bible study. He said, well, I'm atheist. I said, well, I said, uh, that'd be good because I never taught an atheist. And he said, well, come on in. You want, you, you, if you're brave enough to come on in, you come on in. So we sat there on a breakfast bar, on little bar stools, and for an hour and a half, I just I lit it. I mean, if you've ever studied that Larry Smith two-day Bible, wow. It comes on, bells and whistles. I mean, it's, it's aggressive. And so I hit him with it as hard as I could. That's, I mean, that was all. I didn't know anything about it. WD-40 or Slickum or anything. I just hit him as hard as I could. And, and, and so, so, so at the end of the hour and a half, I looked at him. I said, now, Charles, do you believe in God? He said, no. He said, but I think you do. I said, can I come back tomorrow? He said, absolutely. So I went back the next day, and for another hour and a half, I plowed into him. And, I mean, this is the gospel, the only gospel. If you don't believe this gospel, you're going to fry in hell. And I let, I, and so at the end, I said, now, Charles, you believe in God now? He said, no. He said, but I'll be at church Sunday. Can I tell you, when he walked in that church, brother and sister, it lit that place up. Because they all knew him, and they knew who it was, and they all knew that he was a, confess, a professing atheist and all this stuff. And, and, so, and so we prayed for him, but he never got the Holy Ghost while we were there. We closed out revival. And uh, I went on to Carolina, and I was building a church. And this, this was before cell phones. And so he just showed up in South Carolina one day, and he said, I drove all the way over here to tell you I got the Holy Ghost last Sunday night. <laughs> Brother, I was Mr. Bible Study Man. I... I, I, I was ready to win the whole wide world. I was ready to take them on, brother. And, uh, and so, so that really, you know, that was my first convert with a Bible study. And so I began to study the Bible studies, and, and, I would, and, I, and I, you know, at that time, I was a home missionary, and they would give you, they'd give you exploring God's Word. So I said, I'll teach that. They'll give, you, give them to you. I'll teach it. So I studied it, and man, I mean, and uh, we uh, we won a family uh, right out right out of the world. Just I, I remember teaching them. I mean, they just didn't know anything about, and it was an education for me too because I found out that geographical locations have nothing to do. <laughs> you know, I just thought one one day John uh, John got up in church and he said he said. Uh, I told a Baptist preacher today he's going to bust hell wide open, and I thought, now that sounds just like something straight out of Louisiana or Texas. Where did he learn this jargon? Where did he learn this, you know? And I found out that, that uh, it had nothing to do with geographical location. But I was teaching them, and um, one night I had a dream. And in my dream, I saw beautiful Thompson Chain Bible 
hardback burgundy thumb index Bible. And it was laying on this beautiful ornate table and there were stained glass windows and the light was coming through those windows and and I was in this building and and I walked up and I was looking at this Bible and this voice, I never saw anybody, but I heard a voice said, you can't stay in here. You're going to have to get out of here. And I said, all right, I'll go, but I'm going to take this Bible with me. And I took it. And, that, and I woke up and I, and I told my wife, I said, this dream, if I've ever had a dream from the Lord, this was a dream from the Lord. And so I, she, I said, what does it mean? And, 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 and so we began to pray about it. Well, Just a couple of weeks later, I'm at John and Trudy's house, and they said, our next-door neighbor wants to sit in on the Bible study. He came in, had a big beard, and, and uh, had these horn-rimmed glasses and ch on a chain hung, you know, that like hangs around your neck, and he looked like a real egghead, and he laid his Bible up on the table. It was a burgundy, hardback Bible. Thumb index, gold trim, Thompson chain. And I kept looking at it. And he said, I notice you really looking at my Bible. He said, you, you like that? He said, I had to special order this Bible. I said, well, I've, I've seen it before. And uh, I'm trying to make this story short. Frank got the Holy Ghost. He said one day, he said, I want you to go with me. And uh, we rode out at a part of town I'd never been in. It's a big Lutheran church, stained glass windows. He said, uh, they don't lock this church. He said, I'd like for you to go in with me, and um, I want to show you something. I said, Frank, I don't need to go in there because I know what you're going to show me. He said, what? I said, you're going to show me a little table where you used to put your Bible every Sunday and you was a Sunday school teacher in the Lutheran church. But now you're going to be a Sunday school teacher in a Pentecostal church. There is no joy like the soul winner's joy. There's, no, there's nothing as, as satisfying as knowing that you won this person to the Lord. They're on the pew today because of you, because of your prayers, because of your efforts. You taught them. You held on to them. Yeah. You, you wouldn't give up when they were negative. You wouldn't give up when it looked like there was no hope, but you just kept loving them. I don't know if you've ever studied the word com compassion. Uh, I, re I read the book. Healing Evangelism by J. Mark Jordan. I, I will never forget the impact the book had on my life. In it, he talks about compassion. He says, compassion is a deep feeling. An understanding of the misery of a lost soul. Seeing the multitude, Jesus was moved with compassion. I cannot be his disciple and not have some of his compassion. I cannot follow him and give any real justice to being his disciple if I don't feel something of his compassion. People in sin are people in pain. Sin is devastating in its effect. I like what one uh, preacher back home was a black preacher. And uh, he preached a message. The title of his message was, When you gets what you want, is you going to want what you gets. Sin is like that. People think they want it until they get it, and then they don't know what cause it will. It is devastating to their human heart. And Jesus felt that, 
And Jesus looked into the faces of humanity and he said they were like sheep with no shepherd. People need what we've got and this is the only place they can get it. I worked for a Chrysler dealership for one year when I was building a church in Carolina. And this is what the Chrysler, the owner of the dealership told me. Sterling, if a person wants Chrysler product, we've got it. And this is the only place they can get it. I thought about that. If a person sees their need of the Holy Ghost, we've got it. And this is the only place they can get it. There's nothing kind of like Pentecost. There's nothing just as good as Pentecost. There's nothing like the apostolic experience. And this is the only place. You are the only Bible they're going to read. You're the only Jesus they're going to see. I don't want to bore you. Am I doing all right? I don't want to bore you. I, uh, the same voice that told me to go to Carolina told me to leave. I turned the church over to another man, and we went to Macon, Georgia, and just showed up on Billy Davis's doorstep. And uh, his mother, my wife's mother, had just died. And um, so we were, I just said, Brother Davis, I don't know he said, you're going you're gonna to leave your church. I said, I'm leaving my church. Turned it over to somebody else, and I'm here. He said, well, okay. He said, uh, we'll, we'll do whatever we can to help you. And I didn't have any place to preach. I didn't have anywhere to go. I didn't have anything to do. No job, nothing. So I started going to the church every day and praying, and at first I I was hungry. <sighs> I wanted God to give me some souls. Yeah. So I would walk around the church and pray, and it was an hour a day. And then I hate to use the word I, you know, I really do. But I'm just trying to help, I'm trying to help us today. And I started praying two hours a day. And I start pushing that plate back. One day the Lord spoke to me and said, Would you would you teach a black man the Bible study? Would would you teach a very poor black man the Bible study? Phone call came in. A man could hardly talk. He was so illiterate. I had to I had to get there was a policeman in the church, Brother Davis's church, and I had to get a policeman to sh to find this place. He said he said they call this place Booger Bottom. He said somebody gets stabbed or shot here every week. He said, Are you sure you want to go here? Yeah. Yeah. Sammy and Gloria. Sit down in that house and it's stunk in that house. Cockroaches crawling in the floor. No furniture. We just sat on little rickety chairs, that's all they had. I'll never forget Gloria. Just just a poor, poor black lady. She see me. See my car pull up, she she'd be standing there. She said, Sammy, it's at Bible study, man. He's here again. We're gonna talk about Jesus. They came to church and God gave them the Holy Ghost. Gloria's gone on. She's already died, gone on. The next man I won to God was a millionaire. You know, if we want the people that everybody would want, we got to start with the people nobody wants. And the Lord.
Lord will test you and try you to see if you, if you, ego, ego is not going to, it's going to have to be a true burden. There's a difference in competition and burden. There's a difference in ego and burden. There's a, there's a difference in wanting somehow to be elevated and look at me and what I've done. It will never work in outreach. It might work in some other form uh, 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 in the church or some kind of, but it never works in outreach. If you don't have a real burden and get a real burden, it will not develop into a soul winner. You will not. I'm talking to you today I'm out of my heart. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to explain to you, express to you, that God will use you if you make yourself available to Him. I just thought about something. Um, you've got to close the deal. You can't just say, well, you know, I'm going to teach you a Bible study and we'll do that one day. You've got to close the deal. You've got to say Tuesday at 7 o'clock. And then... I remember this one guy, <laughs> I set up a Bible study with him, and I went to his house. How many's ever been dark-housed? You know what I'm talking about? Just act like they're not home? I kept pounding on the door. He wouldn't come to the door. So I went down the road, and I called him on the cell phone. I said, Charles, I know you're in that house. He said, yeah. He said, I just wanted to see how determined you were. I want, I want that cat to the Lord, too, because he, he just, he was like that. He said, I just wanted to see if you was really, really uh, as good at this as you, as you. You got to close the deal. You can't, you can't just, um, you can't just expect people. And, you know, and, and there will be, you know, I'm here telling you about all the great things that happen. I'm not telling you about the times that uh, different things happen. I remember one guy, we went to the Lord, he was he was a character. He had this vehicle. First of all, his wife and kids came, came to church. And I found out later that many, many years ago, she had been in some kind of Pentecostal church. But they drove this vehicle. It was a Dodge Durango jacked up thing with like these expensive uh, wheels. That, you know, that, I mean, they had these rims that were just unbelievable looking thing chrome everywhere and 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 so I, I started teaching her my, me and my wife would go over and my wife told me she said she said I'm going to talk to this lady she said you can't teach her you know because she I mean just like no modesty at all and my wife my wife told me, said look you know when, and so the, she did put on some more clothes and so we were able to sit there at least and talk and and uh and 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 uh Um, the guy, he would hide from us, Terry Johnson. And uh, we'd come over there, and he he he'd go out the back door, and he'd go hide somewhere till we was gone. But guess what? They wound up getting the Holy Ghost, and they're still in the church today. And I remember, I remember they they used to come sit on the very back row. And he said, he said, you know, he said, you know, brother Bubby. He called me Brother Bubby. He said, he said, you know, he said, these people bother me. I see all these people doing all this stuff in church. I said, well, you know what you need to do, Terry? He said, I said, you need to move up a little closer. And they started sitting on the very second row. And Terry and his family, and they filled up a whole pew of people that they brought to church. And, and, and you know, I, I, just, I was proud of them. I was just thankful for them and proud of them. That what God had done in their lives. And uh, he sold that crazy uh, truck, got a decent-looking vehicle and sensible thing and started working a job, and, and, and the Lord started blessing them, and, um, and, and they are still going to church today. Now, how to get home Bible studies? We are in the people business. Develop a prospect file. Get names. Names are handles on souls. Names are important. I like my name. I like to hear my name called. You say, well, Brother Busby, 
I, I don't. I think you do. I think that people do like to hear their name. They, they like somebody to, when they're talking to them, to remember their names. Names are very important. And so names are handles on souls. And when I, I, do, I, I begin to develop my prospect file, wherever I go, I've, I've worked, for, worked for five different pastors. And we've seen souls one in every place I've been. And this is the way I do business. I start a prospect file. Now, it can be as elaborate as you want it. You can do it on your iPad. I don't even know what an iPad is. Uh, you can do it anyway. You can do it old school, new school, modern. My wife just uses those little three-ring binders, you know, those little tiny spiral thing. I don't know how she keeps up with all that. But, but whatever works for you, personalize it. Get it. It's your, it's your personal uh, outreach Prospect file. People rarely represent just themselves. Find out who they are. Find out who's their mama and their daddy and their kids. You know, I like Jerry Cox. He said, I love your mama and your daddy. Well, you need to know their, who their mama and their daddy is. You need to know if they're single, divorced. You know, you don't you want to just go in and ask them all. But, I mean, slowly, as, you're, as you develop, you will learn some things from these people. You... A lot of soul winning is being a good listener. I went to a Bible study one night. And the man said, he said, Jane left me. I came in. All her stuff was gone. I don't know where she is. I don't know. You're not going to teach a Bible study that night. You're going to sit there and cry the blues with the guy. If you care about him. If you want to save him. If you want to see them saved. So, you begin, you begin to develop this prospect file. I, get, I try to get pictures of everybody that I'm working with. I try to get a, um, a, a picture of them. And uh, I'll, have these, I'll have these pictures, and I'll go lay them out on the altar. And I pray for them just like they were there. I pray for their picture just like it was the person there. Lay hands on them. Pray for them. Say, so Brother Busby, I don't know if we need to do all that. Well, I'm telling you that what I have seen work in different places that I've been. Because the more, the, the more you're connected to that person, just like um, this one guy had a, a, a service station in, in uh, Newberry, South Carolina. I'd go by a service station, and uh, I, I went down there one day. I, I waved at him. He was in there doing, working on a car. He said, hey, there's Cokes in the, in the box there. It's open. Just open it up and get you a Coke. And so I sat there and drank a Coke. I got up and went home. I did that three or four weeks in a row. Never, never talked to him at all. But one day I went down there and he said, Hey, I'm so glad you're here. I said, Look, um, you seen my little boy running around here, Bud? You know, you seen him? Bud? He said, Bud's in the hospital. He got shot. The neighbor kid, they were looking at a gun and the kid shot him. And, uh, so I, I went down to the hospital and prayed for him. The bullet had gone in his eye. This is amazing, folks. I'm telling you, the bullet went in his, by his eye and come out the side of his temple. No, nothing. They just dressed the wound just days. He was fine, just doing fine. The Lord touched him. Guess what? That Sunday, guy was in church and got the Holy Ghost. People are crisis-oriented. And they're on different levels of readiness. I'll never forget Brian Johnson. <laughs> My wife said, I don't know if you're doing any good with Brian Johnson. John Johnson John was a drug addict. I didn't know he was on drugs. I get, but I'd be teaching him, and he'd be, he'd be doing this right here while I'm teaching him. One time he fell completely out of the chair. <laughs> and... I said, Brian, are you listening to me? I'll tell you the last three words you said. And he would get it right. My wife said, I don't know if you're doing any good with Brian or not. Guess what? I just preached for Brother Copeland a few weeks ago, a few months ago, and John says in the church, living for God, got his whole family there. People are on different levels of readiness. You can't be offended by their, by their response to the way you're... You just, you're not called to be a success. You're called to be faithful. And if God gives you a Bible study, I take that Bible study serious. This is, this is from God. God gave me this. 
Now, I know, I know there are. You say, well, yeah, but this, I know there is exceptions to what I'm talking about. But by and at large, you need to give the Bible study everything you've got. If God gives you the Bible study, then you need, you need to be very serious about that Bible study. Don't give up on people. I think back in my life, I think about my family. I think about uh, when I was a kid, uh, a man in the church named Berlin, they'd go to the grocery store. He'd say, he'd tell his, he'd say, tell his wife, he'd say, get a gallon of milk for, for us, get a gallon of milk for those Busby kids, get a, get a loaf of bread, get them a loaf of bread. And they would come by, leave it on the porch every Saturday morning. They didn't give up on us. They didn't give up on, on, on my family. Somebody prayed for me. Somebody prayed for you. It's time for you to return that favor. It's time for you to put your effort just like somebody cared for you. Now, people rarely represent just themselves. And so what I try to do with a, with a prospect is I try to make like, like it, you know, and, and, and there's no set pattern to exactly how I do it, but I'll, I'll, I'll have branches. Like, you, you ever seen a family tree? All right, it's something like that. Here's John Doe, my prospect. And I, I got a leg coming off uh, his parents. If, 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 if he's married, her parents. Who are they kin to? Are they kin to anybody in the church? Are they connected some way? What is that connection? And then I begin to, I begin to write down notes about them. And, and so if it's a cold, rainy day, or, or if I'm out of town or whatever, I'll call them from out of town. Man, you thought about me? You're out doing something, and you, th you actually thought about me today? Yeah, by the way, uh, you, got, you got a surgery coming up, don't you? You're going to have this. Uh, some, and, and, hey, you don't do it, I promise you. Billy Bob, Baptist preacher, will do it. He'll go see them. And they'll be in the Baptist church. Praise God. We, we are in the people business. And we've got to be interested in them as souls that God has given us. So we cannot excuse ourselves by saying, well, I, I, I talked to this person. I tried. That's not good enough. People rarely represent themselves. And so I put people on 30-day uh, return. I put, I put the name down, put it down 30 days. Got a map, I mean a calendar, 30 days. I'll contact them at the end of the 30 days. If they seem like they're not interested, I'll contact them at the end of 30 days. If they still, then 60 days. Be sure they get a Christmas card from you. Be sure they get a birthday card from you. Be sure, be sure that you're interested in, if, 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 if they're kids and it's graduation time, anybody in that family graduate. Say, Brother Busby, do you really do all that? Yes, I really do all that. Yeah. Why? Because I want to win souls. God has given me, commissioned me, told me to be after the business of winning souls. Somebody asked me the other day, said, what, what is the first thing you do? I study church records. And if people would sit down with me when I go to a church, I'll, I'll alphabetize the whole church. If they got a church directory, I love church directories. When I go in, I don't know anybody, and I start learning all this. And then I, I try to interview everybody that will let me interview them. Who do you know in this town? Who is the butcher, baker, and candlestick maker? Occupa if I can't find anybody by church guests, then I start on occupations. Who in this town is a doctor? Who in this town is a dentist? Who in this town is a mechanic? And so that's the way I approach you be surprised. Now, if we prepare ourselves, our chance will come. If we make ourselves available, God will make himself available. A lot of what we do is so academic and so elementary, but we overlook it, bypass it, and simply say, well, nobody in this place wants God. I was at a church one day. I was preaching a revival. And it was, I'll just say this, it was, it, was, it was in North Georgia. And I went in the sanctuary, and the pastor was in there weeping profusely. And so I thought, well, 
Maybe somebody in the church died or something. I don't know. So I, so I eased up to him and I said, uh, I said, are you okay? He said, yeah. He said, but you know, he said, nobody in this town wants God. And I don't do this very often, brother. I, I'm not a smart aleck. I'm not, I, you know, I, I, I mean, sometimes I say, well, maybe they don't. You know, maybe we need to, you know, I don't know. But, but something came over me and I said, that's a lie. And he looked at me like I'd slapped him across the face. I said, we're going right now. Can you get, we're going right now, and I'm going to show you somebody in this town wants God. Right now. We got in the truck. We drove down the road. There was a man and woman sitting on a park bench like they was waiting on a bus, but they wasn't waiting on a bus, but it looked like they was. And so I said, right there. Those people right there, want the, want, they want the Holy Ghost. He said, Busby, I think. I said, all right, you just sit in the truck then. I went over there, and I started talking to them people. That night, they got baptized in Jesus' name. The devil is a liar. People are so hungry from, for God that they're watching Harry Potter on, on movies. They're so hungry for God that they're studying about vampires. They're so hungry for the supernatural that they don't know what to do. And it's our commission is to take God to them. So I said, well, if we just have good church, they'll come. No, they won't. People drive me crazy with that. Your evangelistic efforts cannot just be your, your church services, Sunday and midweek, Sunday and midweek. It can't be Smokey Joe Evangelist from Kokomo. And he's, he's I mean, that all has its place, and it's all great, and it's all good, but it's not going to do what I'm talking about right now. Somebody's going to have to go sit in the living room with them. Somebody's going to have to eat cookies that are stale and don't taste good. Somebody's going to have to let a baby sit on their knee with a dirty diaper. Somebody's going to have to really have a burden. Praise God. Have we got another, have we got another show? Okay, let's see another one. Praise God. Okay, would everybody like to stretch Now, one thing, one thing about me, when I get on this, I don't know when to quit, so you'll have to tell me when to quit. It's okay. I'm, I will not be offended. Um, how many appreciate Brother Varnum? Can you, feel, can you feel the burden he's got when he's talking about it? All right. Now, I want to have a little fun here, and uh, I just want to talk to you about some do's and don'ts. Um, how many want a few do's and don'ts? Just a few, okay? One is don't give up easy. I went to teach a Bible study. Uh, Brother Coley Reese got in the church, and I was, um, uh, he was working at this place, and, and, and this co-worker of his wanted, wanted a Bible study, and Coley just, you know, he was just fresh in the church, so he said, he said, I need you to go teach it. I can't teach it. So, so, uh, we started going, and we had to drive 40 miles down there. And I'll never forget, when I would go in and sit down to uh, teach, the lady would get up and leave the table. And she would go and walk down the hallway and, and go in a room. And I started to ask the man what was going on. I said, I'm not going to ask anybody anything. I'm just going to keep teaching. The Lord sent me here to teach. I'm going to do my job. And I taught for, I think it was six weeks. Every time I come in, same scenario. She would get up from the table, go down the hallway, go in the room, close the door. I found out later that she was laying in the floor. Because every time I would start talking, she would start weeping. And she would crack that door just enough to hear my voice. She's in the church today. They're still going to Brother Davis's church. They're winning souls to the Lord. So don't give up easy. If, if, you, if you think something's not happening, you don't know what's happening. So just leave it in the hands of the Lord and don't give up easy. Don't let it bother you if your prospects and your Bible study don't start coming to church. I remember one time, 
I was teaching these people. <laughs> and this lady in the church, I mean, and bless her heart, I mean, you know. And she, well, Brother Busby, you've been teaching these people. Where are they? I said, well, where were you Wednesday night? It's not their nature to go to church. They think, they think if they go Christmas and Easter, they've done it all, man. That's the way they think. That you got to understand their nature is not like our we still can't we got some saints that we can't convince that you should go to church that often. So don't let that bother you. You say, well, I've been teaching them for three weeks, they still ain't come to church. Don't let that bother you. Your job is to teach them, pray them through in the living room. Okay? All right, let's look at some do's and don'ts of teaching Bible study. Don't be afraid to say, I don't know. I do it, I do it a lot just to make the person feel comfortable. They don't, they're not looking for a preacher with a suit and tie. If they did, they, if they wanted a preacher with a suit and tie that's been to seminary and, and knows all this, they would go to church. They've asked you to come to their home because they like you, they got confidence in you, and you are sharing with them. You're not. You're not a preacher. When I go when I go teach a Bible study, I don't wear a shirt and tie, suit and tie. I wear just just casual dress clothes. I always look nice. My wife dresses me good, but I'm saying that they don't want a preacher. They want a friend. And so that's the way, and so if they ask you like I mean, how many's ever been asked who was Cain's wife? I don't know who Cain's wife was. I don't care who Cain's wife was. And, 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 and so when they ask me, I say, you know, I don't know. You don't know? I don't know. Don't be afraid to say I don't know. Another thing, when you start a Bible study, don't take a Bible like this to the Bible study. Come in there with that big Bible and slam it down on the table. They think, my Lord, Billy Graham. This is, he's Billy Graham. I usually take a Bible and put it in my shirt pocket. They got them. You can read them, big print and everything. I mean, just tiny little Bibles. They're less offensive. You don't need every scripture that's on. You, don't, you won't have to. Now, when you get over into the doctrine, lesson five, and you're teaching on water baptism, and you're proving that by, by the 12 men of Ephesus and, and Cornelius' household and the Samaritans, and you're doing all that, that's, that's a different thing. But just like lesson one, you don't need to read every. You leave that. You leave that. Um, Lesson guide with them, they can read every scripture when you're gone. You're not there to give them, you're not there to impress them with how much you know about the Bible. Because they really don't care how much you know unless they know how much you care. Okay? We're talking right now about some do's and don'ts. Never take a manual, or at least with, with this Bible study, don't take the manual to your Bible study. You take a manual to the Bible study, they're going to take that manual away from you. And then what are you going to do? No, you can't look at this. I want to look at it right now. No, you can't. You, you're, the, you're, the, you're the dummy for taking the thing in there. That's your manual. That's your study guide. That's your homework. And if you take it to the Bible study, well, you, you're going to get shoot yourself in the foot. Okay? Um, don't teach in the attack mode. When you, the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Let it do its work. Let it cut them to pieces. You don't hack them to pieces. You let the Word of God cut them to pieces. Let it pierce them asunder. Let it do its work. Okay? Don't answer judgment questions. As soon as you start teaching Bible studies, you're going to get to say, well, my grandma was a good old gal. You believe she's in heaven now? Oh, in other words, you're saying they went to hell. Questions like that? There's only one answer. I am not the judge. They are in the hands of a just God. You know what? This Bible study is personally for you. Yeah, well, my grandma was great. I believe she had an experience with God. 
There's nothing wrong with telling them they have an experience with God. Most people do have some kind of experience with God. Here's another thing. What I'm teaching you today will not detract from the experience you already have with God. It will only add to it. That's the way you approach it. You don't tell them, bless God, you ain't got nothing until you speak in tongues. All we got to do is use our head, folks. A lot of this stuff is just, just academic. Don't answer questions that will be answered later. I always tell them, when I, when I taught Search for Truth, everything was in Lesson 10. Oh, we're going to talk about that in Lesson 10. By the time we get to Lesson 10, they ain't going to care who Cain's wife was. They're not going to, they're not, they're not going to care how many animals was on the ark and how many, how many uh, boxcar loads it would hold and all that kind of stuff. So now I tell them it's in Lesson 4. Yeah, but when we're going to talk about all, oh, well, you know, that's going to be, we're going to talk about that. In lesson 4 cover all that. Now, have a, you say, well, Brother Busby, you shouldn't do that. Well, tell them something. Don't, don't go into some kind of judgmental. Don't let them take you in there. Don't let them put you in the corner. You tell them, you know, we're going to, the first thing you do, you sit, down to, uh, you sit down to do a Bible study. You say, look, if any questions come in your mind, just write them down. Have your little piece of paper. Write those questions down, and we'll deal with it at the end of the, of the class. I'm going to tell you what. When you, get, when you get people and you start talking about blood on the doorpost, brother, they'll forget all this other kind of crazy stuff. They'll forget these weird questions. They won't even care anymore. Because when the Holy Ghost pierces their soul with blood on the doorpost and the type and shadow in the tabernacle, all this crazy stuff they've been thinking about is going to go away. Um, when you say the Bible study's over, I stay at people's house 45 minutes. I start heading for the door. I've had them follow me all the way out to the car. I'm going home because I know one thing. I know that, I know that if, if, let's, say he's a, let's say he's a construction worker. Mm-hmm. When that alarm clock goes off the next morning, he said, I'll tell you one thing, Busby ain't coming back here. There's always next time. There's always the next, next week. There's always the next Bible study. You say, well, we didn't finish. We're going to finish that. It's more important that you keep the Bible study. If, if, you go, if you go to the house six weeks, seven weeks, it's more important that you keep them as friends and keep the thing going than it is to prove your point Teach everything, dot and jot and tittle on the on the chart. I hope I'm making sense right now. All right. Um, some time ago, um, June or July, I w- we were in Michigan. It was very hot this year in Michigan, and we were we came up to we were in Milwaukee. We came up to an intersection, and there were young people. Um, they were not Pentecostal, but they were very presentable. They weren't, uh, e- even even though some of the some of the young ladies had on pants, they were they were not shorts. They were f- they looked presentable. What I'm trying to say, and they were handing out ice water. Cold water had a sign, free bottled water, and so my wife was. On that, she rolled down the window. They handed her an ice cold bottle of water on the label. I still got the bottle. Still, still. Sometimes I look at the label. The young people of United Methodist Church, Milwaukee. People like for you to give them something. I don't know. I'm the same way. I love free stuff. I just love people giving me something. And I went to spend a week with Arlie Forsyth in uh, Wichita, Kansas. He teaches an average. For the last 20 years, he has taught an average of 12 Bible studies a week. And I went to spend a week with him because of boot camp. And I was in boot camp. He said, uh, we got to go by the bakery. We pulled up to the bakery, and this man has a, has a minivan. He has built trays and uh, uh, they give him donuts, and he runs a donut route. 
I said, how long have you been doing this? He said, oh, for about two years now. He said, this has got me more Bible studies than anything I've ever done. So I'm just, I'm just observing all this. I went home, and I said, Lord, you know, I do not have money to go out here because, you know, donuts start costing. After, after a few dozen of them, they start costing, you know, and, and I don't have the money. So phone rang one day. The man said, I think this family, I think you need to go see them, and gave me their name, address. I went out there, sitting there talking to them. I asked the lady, I said, by the way, the man told me he was uh, disabled and retired. I asked the lady, what do you do? I run a bakery. So she started giving me donuts. I started running the donut route. I looked at church one night, and there was a whole pew of people on my donut route. Now, I'm not saying that you need to go get donuts. I don't know what we need to do, but I know that people like for you to give them something. Now, you, you know, if you can put your brain to this. Whatever it takes. The story of the little boy, little boy on the fishing wharf. He sees an old man at the end, and the man's hauling fish in. He goes down and he says, Sir, what is your favorite bait? He said, Whatever they're biting, son. So I'm telling you that these things uh, are tried and proven. Bible study is a key ingredient. To church growth. I wonder if we could stand right now. And uh, I, I want us to ask the Lord to give us a spirit of yeah. of unity and togetherness and zeal and fire and just touch us right now. Maybe we would pray for each other. Just just end this thing in prayer right now. Lord Jesus. I love you today. Thank you for this beautiful group of people that want to use. They want to be used. Hallelujah. Oh, that's it. Lift your voice. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise.